All right, it's another top 20 uh, fails or mistakes today. Today, it's water changes. Yeah, so this is probably, probably the most common task that we all have to do with our reef tank, which means the most commonly made mistakes happen right here. And uh, we're gonna share what we've learned from uh, water changes. So we've done uh, like all the salt mix stuff before. Yeah. So we're not gonna dive into that. This is actually the simple task of doing a water change. You think it's simple, but there's so many places you could either mess this up or do even better. All right, so starting with number one, super heavily debated thing. You see it all the time. Oh yeah, this is uh, the no water change conversation. And for, for us, it was a destination and not a starting point, especially like with the 160. Uh, we had tried this approach to minimal water changes, no water changes, and it worked. And then we tried uh, from day one, no minimal to no water changes on the ULM tanks, and it absolutely didn't work. Yeah, so that's the fail there, that understanding that it is a destination, not a starting point. And the defining characteristics of a tank that can handle no water changes is usually, this is like a five to 10 year tank, just filled to the brim with yeah. corals, has coralline algae covering everything, probably has a really healthy microfauna mm. population, just a healthy, robust system. The corals that are used to being in an environment that probably has some pollutants in it, yeah. and they've just kind of uh, grown over. And one of the things here too, is there is an attrition factor. like. After like five to 10 years, it's just like corals that don't make it in that kind of environment have already kind of like been weeded out. Right. And the ones that are left over are the ones that thrive in that environment. Yep. So I've heard that from a lot of people that do it as well. And their tank is just kind of an attrition mm. you know, tank. So the things though, that all those things aren't true in a new tank. You don't have a healthy microfauna nope. population. You don't have healthy coralline algae. You generally don't have a, a, like a slew of large, robust corals all over the place. Yeah. And it's just a totally different environment. And so that's why when we tried it from the beginning with those ULMs, it just didn't work out. However, it did work with the 160, which is an established robust tank. Yes. So like, just keep that in mind when you're watching the different takes on water changes and think about where you are in that scale and why some of these approaches might work for you at, this, at the point that you're actually in. All right, so number two, it's pretty obvious, but actually a lot of people miss it. Yeah, this is the, the ratio of water changes. And the mistake here is thinking that, or is missing that a 10% water change leaves 90% of your problems still in the tank. So uh, if there is a problem that you're trying to solve, larger water changes means larger reduction in the problem. Yeah, so like if you have really high nitrate or phosphate or like some kind of contaminant in the tank and you're like, oh, water change is my solution. Mm. And I go do a 20% water change, 80% of the problem still is there. still there. Like it didn't really do, a, a, it's not really a solution. Yeah. Sometimes if you do like a 50% water change, you can see the levels drop to 50% and maybe no longer it's a problem or an irritant to the corals any longer. Mm but it's probably gonna creep back up again, right? Yeah, unless you continually stay on top of them. Yeah. yeah, so that's one of the reasons why if you have like a problem you're trying to correct, I usually recommend do like three or four 30% water changes strung together and change out most of the water mm. of the tank over the course of a week or so, right? Uh, also though, like that's something to keep in mind when I'm doing my 10% water changes every single week, I'm really just kind of trying, it's probably gonna elevate over time. You know, yeah. anything that's in the tank that I've got any of the inputs, and if you watch our like pollutants video, you'll mm. know all the inputs. But you're just gonna see that go slowly up over time. And why like once or maybe twice a year, I might up it to like 20% a week and then get the levels back down again. All right, so number three is actually an alternative because you may not be able to do all those water changes all at once. Yeah, the mistake here is not considering uh, other additional you know, contributions to water changes. So if water changes aren't solving the problem, there's some chemical medias out there that can help solve the problem, specifically the one you turned me on to the other day, Brightwell's Purit. Yeah, I actually wasn't familiar with Purit either mm. uh, until uh, I watched an episode on, sadly, Enrico's Aquarium channel. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, he thought that he had a salt mix that uh, caused a lot of serious problems in his tank. And I don't know if they ever identified what the actual cause was, mm. but he's got a thousand gallon tank. Yeah. And like you know, whole tons of corals were going down, right? So doing a 50% water change a on a thousand gallon tank, maybe just isn't even an option. Yeah. You may not have 500 gallons of water sitting around. <laughs> you probably don't. Uh, 
So in that case, you know, you can use media to take stuff out and you don't really know exactly what's in the tank. So you don't really know the exact tool to take it out. Mm. But something like Purit is like a resin that will take out like heavy metals. And I think we should actually do an investigates on this. There you go. So I thought we could actually take some like Triton and like dose heavy metals or something <laughs> to it uh, or metals rather, and then see it if we can take it out. So we'll get to that maybe in the future. Mm. But in this case, you know, Rico was actually able to use the Purit and all of a sudden the tank just turned around. So whatever was in the tank that was causing the problem, you know, the Purit solved that problem for him. So really think about other solutions. If you can't do large water change, maybe having something like that on hand just in case, or, you know, recommending it to a fish store that you'd like to see them have it on hand so you can just walk down there. You can always yep. overnight it from us, but, you know, going down to your fish store and picking it up overnight is actually a lot easier. All right, so number four is actually something I've been using since my very first tank, but I actually don't think is uh, as popular as it probably should be. Yeah, I've never used one uh, until I got here, and that's missing the value of the no spill and fill python. So the it hooks up to your you know kitchen sink or utility sink. Really, you know, big with the freshwater community because I can not only start the siphon and drain down my sink, but then I can turn it and push water back out to the uh, to the tank. So for us, there's a, you know, a couple different options that you have instead of just draining, but I don't know how many times I've put a hose into my tank, down to a five gallon bucket, started the siphon with my mouth, got some stuff in there, and then walked away only to come back and water all over the place. Yeah. So now yeah, with this thing, I uh, go straight to my sink and it even starts the siphon for me. That, can't get any easier than that. Lives up to the name. Yeah. Uh, no spill, no fill. There you like, go. You don't want to get water on your floor. Uh, this is the solution. So again, you screw it on your tap, you bring the hose to your tank and turn on the siphon, sucks water out of your tank, sends it right down the drain. Mm -hmm. And then if you want, you can actually screw on a pump and put it into your saltwater bin and then send water right back in your tank. No more hauling buckets, no more getting that nasty tank water in your mouth. Yeah. And uh, all around, just a way, way better tool than hauling around buckets. All right, so number five is actually almost the exact same thing here. Yeah, that's using your uh, mouth to start the siphon uh, out of the tube, and that's just stuff. Coral toxins, fish waste, you know, things that I just don't want in my mouth, and uh, I personally just don't like the taste of salt water. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I, I, you just don't think about it, but that water is absolutely full of decaying food, mm. fish poop, you know, decaying any, all kinds of different decaying tissue. Yeah. Uh, and you all hear the horror stories about palithoa toxin and whatnot. Mm. Like all that stuff is in the water. Okay, so you've probably done it a thousand times and never had any issues, yeah. but really the type of problems that come from this are not the kind of ones you want to experience. All right, so number six, the little brother to the python. Yeah, this is uh, the small gravel wash and missing in the value of it. It's this little fine little detail guy right here. And I saw this from WWC when I was watching them clean out their uh, 293 mixed reef. They've got really fine sand bed in there. And because it's in the front of their store, they're constantly in there just siphoning maybe little uh, you know diatoms or little brown algae, detritus and stuff build up. But it, it's perfect for that detail type work and to get you know in the your rockscape in those really tight places that the big giant hose can't get to. Uh, with that little detail one, I can, and it doesn't suck out very much water, so it's not making a major impact on how much you're pulling out. Yeah, so I've seen actually people like uh, uh, glue like scrubbies to the end of it that look like kind of like oh, toothbrushes yeah. and whatnot. So when you're scrubbing the rock off, you can see it all just suck up all the debris. Mm -hmm. and rather than just going into the tank to rot, it's actually leaving the tank. Okay, so number seven is actually something I first attempted like just a few years ago and I uh, <laughs> wish I did before. Yeah, the mistake here is not using a submersible pump and I found this to work in both ways. That's not only just filling the tank uh, and pumping water up into the top of the tank rather than dumping buckets over the edge, uh, but even the reverse of that and drawing water out of my tank just makes that process so much quicker. Yeah, so it doesn't matter if you're using a siphon, going to the sink, you know, the siphon's kind of slow, it goes yeah. pretty slow. Or filling it, same kind of thing. And even using buckets, sloshing everything around. Yeah, it's dangerous. So if you can screw a submersible pump onto a tube, you can pump the water in there so fast. You can be done with your water change inside of two minutes. And if you make it easy, you'll actually do it. Mm. Uh, a recent addition by CJ is actually this guy, where you just set it down and you can suck water out of your sump all the way to yeah. the very, very bottom. Yeah. And you can actually just reverse it and throw it on the other end, drop it in your tank, and just suck water out of the tank and send it down into your sink. Mm -hmm. Just super easy. And again, if you can make it easy, you'll actually do it. All right, of course, number eight, also done more than once. Yeah, this is using water containers or water change containers that are just 
hard to clean. So, you know, like a 20 gallon, 40 gallon brute trash can, easy. It's got a wide mouth. I can get in there, I can scrub it, I can turn it upside down, take it out, rinse it with a garden hose, what have you. You know, you start getting into these 200, 300 gallon, you know, bins. And a lot of times they have a big enough hole in there. Like if I have to go inside and clean, I can. Uh, but some of these other ones uh, look really nice but the hole in the access port on them is you know, smaller than maybe my shoulder. That's pretty common on like the 60 gallon tubs that you mm -hmm. see. Uh, we have a couple of them we use here at the office and then the port's only about this big. So it's super, super hard to clean. They look really nice until you think about it. Yeah. Especially if you're using like a salt mix, it tends to dirty the bin up. So one of the things that I like to look for and uh, people often ask where you get to these really nice bins mm -hmm. and usually you buy them from like Norwesco yep. or ask them from or for a distributor. Yep. But look for something that actually has an open top lid. So so the entire lid comes off. It doesn't like screw mm. off. So that it's super easy to get inside and clean it out because someday you're gonna want to and you're gonna wanna make sure that it's easy. Okay, so number nine is also something I learned in the last couple of years. Yeah, this is uh, not mixing your salt mix overnight. So while you're sleeping, mix your salt and then use it in the morning. So what we learned from the BRSTV investigates some salts take longer than others, maybe upwards of 24 hours or more to actually homogeneously mix. Uh, and you know, just to be on the safe side, just put your uh, salt mix in your bin overnight. When you wake up, it's ready to go. So if you're out there saying, well, wait, 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 wait. I've mixed mine up and used it inside of an hour. Yeah, that's true. It's true, you're gonna do 10% water and it's not perfect. The mm. uh, fish are probably not gonna jump out. But if you're asking what the best practice is, uh, I think we pretty clearly identified that yeah. eight hours is about the minimum I do with any of the salts. Mm. And some of them actually needed more than 24 hours. And if you're just looking down in a dark bin in your basement or a garage, you may not actually be able to tell. Ah, but nice. in all the experiments that we were doing, it was pretty easy to see when this stuff actually got homogeneously mixed. And there's some salts out there that have really specific uh, requirements for how you mix it. So I would definitely check with the manufacturer, but mm -hmm. most of them out there, I would mix the day before I want to use it unless it was a total emergency. All right, so number 10 is actually just a personal belief of my own, but what is it? <laughs> yeah, this is uh, making the mistake of not mixing a month's worth of salt water at a time. Uh, some of these have been known to store, you know, for a long time. Here we, we keep like 200, 350 gallons at a time, uh, more than a month's worth for like three, four tanks. Uh, and some store better than others, meaning the parameters uh, remain stable for like alkalinity, calcium and what have you uh, throughout the entire storage. So get yourself a big enough container that lasts through a month and mix a month's worth. Okay, so they don't all store super well. Yeah. Uh, anything that's got like uh, amino acids and bacteria and biopolymers and all that kind of stuff in mm. it, they don't store very well. But most of them do. And so the reason this is a fail for me is because if I have to go mix it up 24 hours beforehand, mm -hmm. every single week, and like remember to do that on Saturday for Sunday's water change, the chances I'm gonna do this is to get increasingly low, right? <laughs> However, if I can do that once for the entire month, the chances I'll do that 10 percent just two bucket water chains mm -hmm. on Sunday is really really high yeah right true and so if I can reduce the amount of work so I'll use a salt that actually does mix well and uh, like doesn't have levels of drop mm -hmm. and doesn't get all kinds of crud that builds up from it and that will allow me to make doing water changes way easier meaning again I'll actually do them all right, so number 11 is actually, you don't have to use the best salts out there to get similar results and be able to store it. You can also do another option. Yeah, the uh, mistake is not using a sediment filter on your storage bin to run your salt water through before it goes into your, you know, your buckets or your tank or even just your tank. It's something that we do here on our, on our salt mixing bins. We have a big, you know, 20 inch sediment filter, you know, and we run every bit of salt water goes through there before it goes to the hose. And so everybody gets you know scrubbed salt water, whether there's impurities, whether there's precipitate or something in your salt bin, it's not getting through and into your tank. Yeah, and the other way that it's commonly used is just taking like a BRS reactor, mm. throw it in a sediment filter and a pump on it, and set it down in yep. the bin. It'll continually cycle out all the stuff, which means not only is that stuff not going in your tank, but it's also not building up on the walls of, uh, your, of your container as well. So just kind of a win-win there, super easy solution to make sure that you're never dealing with any of that brown crud. All right, so number 12, we're gonna actually have to do like a, a how-to video on because it's actually super, super cool. Zach turned us onto this one. Yeah, the mistake is not considering those uh, DIY or those hose reels. For garden hoses, where you can pull out a lot of hose, drain your tank or what have you, 
and then give it a little tug and zip goes the line back in and you're done. So it keeps, you know, long hoses out of the way. I mean, it works perfect for a garden. And then we started using them here and it was a game changer where we have one to suck water out of the tank, which means uh, you can keep the garden, the garden hose that comes in it. And then if you get a second one, you can actually replace the garden hose inside of it with some Python tubing, reef safe stuff, and then you can push water back into it with a separate hose reel. Yeah, so it's important that you replace the hose inside there because you don't want to send fresh salt water through a garden hose, which is you know far from reef safe. Yeah. Sucking it out, no big deal. I gotta tell you, I just put this on my house just for my garden outside. And as soon as I pulled it out, went 50 feet, watered everything, and then just pulled the thing back and it just went right back in. Like, <laughs> why do the other ones even exist? <laughs> I, they shouldn't even exist in the plant because they're yeah. all garbage. Yeah. This thing is so awesome. We use it here again to fill and uh, take uh, water out of tanks. So if you do it, you know, really think about how the value here for like 80 bucks, you can now take that tube and for all of you that have taken a 50 foot tube and like coiled it yeah, around, it gets kinks in it, it's just a big pain in the butt. Now you can get it to instantly retract. All right, so now number 13, something a little bit more common that uh, a lot of people mm. probably don't do. Yeah, the mistake is when you're making a large water change, matching the alkalinity temperature and parameters like that. You know, it's one thing when we say like 10%, you know, 10% water changes leaves 90% of the problem. Well, 10% water change doesn't really drastically affect like the alkalinity and all this other stuff. But if I do a 50, 60, 70%, now my alkalinity and my temperature really comes into play. Yeah, so if you're like, say your DKH, your tank is nine and it's seven in the water change, but do 10% water change, it's not gonna make any difference. Not really. Uh, you're not gonna be, not, you're not even gonna be able to test for it with a common test kit, the, the difference probably and get it accurately. But again, if I'm gonna do 25%, now will probably have a meaningful impact temperature as well. If I got a 78 degree tank here and the water's been sitting in my basement and it's 65 degrees, a 25% change is probably going to change the temperature a lot more than you want to. Mm. So 10%, I generally don't heat uh, or correct any of the chemicals in it. However, if I'm going to uh, do anything bigger than that, you should do the alkalinity and you should do temperature. The rest of them probably don't matter as much as those two. All right, so number 14 is actually a problem for me because I like auto water changes and takes away the ability to do this. Yeah, the, it's a mistake to not you know, use the time while you're doing a water change and you have this siphon to vacuum out your sand bed. I mean, these Python you know, gravel vacs and things, they, they're made for this purpose. They work really well. And it's something satisfying about sticking your end of your gravel tube in there while you're siphoning and seeing this dirty, dusty muck float up and out of the tank. Yeah, so for me, there's something that like a lot of people call old tank syndrome, mm. right? And there's no real thing is like tank doesn't actually just get old. Something is happening in the tank where, you know, things start to go south. And for me, tanks would have sand in them. One of the biggest causes that I personally believe is all that gunk that builds up in the sand. Mm. And if you wonder if it's there, go stir it up and you'll watch all this brown crud come out. So every time you do a water change, pick a place and just do a really good cleaning of that one corner of the tank. Maybe just the corner that you think that it collects the most mm -hmm. in. And you know, really clean up the tank if you get a chance. Even with my auto water changes, I like to go in and do another water change just to get that done. All right, so number 15, this is also another good time for something else valuable. Yeah, same thing. Uh, don't miss the, or don't make the mistake of you have a siphon going and you want to get something out of the tank. Algae is a great one to get out of the tank at this time. So, you know, a lot of people, you can go down there and, you know, pinch, uh, pinch tufts of algae off while you siphon, watch it get sucked back up into the, out of the tank. Uh, this is the perfect time. Either do your scrubbing beforehand, get it all suspended, and you know, siphon it around, get the big chunks, but it's just stuff that you don't wanna leave in your tank. Yeah, so I think I've seen a lot of people, and I've done it myself, where you go scrub off all the algae and miss the fact that all that algae is just going to decay in the tank, turn back into nitrogen and phosphorus, and then feed the next algae waste. <laughs> like true. you actually haven't removed the problem. Yeah. You've just like started the cycle for the next problem. Yeah. So if you're going to manually remove it, you know, do what he said, which is grab a little bit of your thumb on your siphon and just pull it off, watch it suck out. If you're going to scrub it off with a tool, put the siphon next to it and scrub it off and suck it out. So during the water change, it's just a great time to actually manually remove all of that algae. All right, so number 16 is also something I actually learned this very year. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say this, no, but yeah. like it never was a problem until this very year for me. 
Yeah, the mistake here is not considering the exposed corals, especially during a large water change. Or if you have a tank like us, like the BRS-160, where the corals are growing right up to the edge of the water, that means uh, if I'm in there doing a water change, my water level drops. And if I'm not doing this you know, expeditiously as fast as I can, it leaves those corals exposed to the air, which, you know, that could dry them out. This is when we did a large water change on the 160, I just made sure that while I was filling up the tank because it was slow, to splash water all over the corals. Yeah, I've done similar things. Mm. Like uh, if I know that the water's down, gonna be down for a little while, I'll find a way to mist the corals and make sure they're uh, wet. But one of the things we happened this year with yeah. the XXL 750 mm. is we did a really large water change. Uh, I can't remember why we did it, but, we brought it down to here, and all of a sudden the coralline algae on the back, all the way across to the back of the tank, all died to right there. Yep. And I still don't know the exact reason as to why maybe it dried out, but one of the things that people said on Ask BRS TV was that the lighting, probably it was mm. way too bright once you removed the water, and it bleached all of the coralline algae oh, in the wow. back. Yeah, it's interesting. So I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, like now that it's in my head, I'm gonna turn my lights off when I, gonna, when I, anytime I'm going to expose the corals below the water. I haven't had an issue with it before, but you know what? Uh, you learn something new every year, yeah. and I can avoid a future issues for sure. So number 17, actually a fire hazard. Oh yeah, this is uh, not turning off your heater during a water change, specifically if you like have a water change going on in your sump and that's where you just primarily do it. Those are, you know, that heating element gets exposed. If it's glass, it has a potential of like shattering. Uh, if it's metal or even just a glass one, you can melt the side of your acrylic sump uh, or the plastic housing around it. It's just not a good idea. So the biggest issue is for those of you that have tanks where the heater's actually in the tank mm. because it will always get uh, unsubmerged at that point when you're doing a water change. So make sure to turn it off. Yeah. You'll ruin the heater, pos possibly cause totally other big issues. Maybe it melts and adds stuff to your, uh, your tank. But in your sump, make sure that it's in a place that uh, when you know the sump gets turned off or, or you're doing the water change, you'll never siphon the water out. But really, just turn the heater off anytime you do a water change and you'll be way, way safer. Number 18 is actually just something that applies to most people, but not all. What is yeah. it? Yeah, this is forgetting to turn off your skimmer during a water change. And you know, this kind of goes back to the last one. Uh, so I've got a heater, I've got a skimmer. These are just kind of things that I should get used to turning off every time. The skimmer specifically because you turn off the power of the return pump, fills up the sump, and now your skimmer overflows. Fish poop everywhere. And it's just not, not a pretty sight. So well, just have like a dedicated power strip or, you know, if you have a controller, and make sure that those are turned off or set to turn off automatically when you do a water change. Yeah, so actually what happens is you're trying to clean the tank up, mm. but the water level in the sump goes up, so the water level in the skimmer goes up, dumps all of what's in the cup into the tank, Dirty and tank. you actually just polluted the <laughs> tank, you know, full of fish turds and yep. ammonia and God knows what else yeah. is in there. So make sure that you turn it off, I said this doesn't apply to everybody, and part of that is because if you have like a recirculating skimmer or some mm, other unique true. designs, you know, you really don't have to be as dependent about the water level for performance. So if you have one of those designs like a recirculating skimmer, maybe you don't have to turn it off. All right, so number 19 is actually something a lot of us do. We like to turkey baste and uh, get all of the detritus and gunk off the rock. However, there's kind of a right way and kind of a wrong way. Yeah, so I, I think the mistake here is uh, trying to do this during your water change uh, rather than uh, maybe an hour prior uh, go and get all that stuff you know get use a turkey baster use your little peam up on a stick type uh, water jet and get all that stuff suspended but then give it some time while the tank is running this you're going to change your filter socks out anyway most likely during a water change this is a perfect time to get that stuff suspended get it down the back into the filtration into the filter socks and then, you know, after about an hour when I come to my water change, a lot of that stuff might be pulled up at, uh, in dead spots in my tank and I can get it with the siphon. So the major miss to make sure that everybody's on this is when I clean it off and I do a water change, I'm only gonna remove 10% of it. So 90% is still in the water. Yeah. So if you're gonna do that and you're gonna baste all of it off or use that acrylic rod that I like to use with the peam up on the end, yeah. uh, if you're gonna do either one of those things, make sure that you do it prior to the water change and then change out your filter socks slightly after because the combination of those two will probably produce the best results. 
All right, so number 20, biggest fail. Actually, this is most near and dear to my heart. I can't <laughs> believe we made it last, but what is it? Uh, yeah, this is not considering auto water changes. So I'm, I'm in that camp of people who I just don't want to carry buckets around anymore. I don't want to drag out hoses. I don't want the potential you know, spills on my floor from me forget it, walking away from a bucket. Uh, and so I'm at this, the point in my reefing career where it's time that every tank I set up just has this done for me automatically, and I go mix up a month's worth at a time. Yeah, really, just from auto water changes to auto top off mm. to dosing pumps to dose, I mean, we like to just get, kind of get rid of one task at a time so that the tank becomes something you can enjoy instead of just work. Yeah. But really, there's one of two camps here you are, or types of person that you are. Mm -hmm. So either you're super good about your water changes, whatever rhythm it is, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, and you're like, man, I'll do that every single time without <laughs> fail. doesn't matter if it's snowy out, yeah. it's sunny out, or anything <laughs> fun's going on in my life. I'll always do it because I care about my tank. And then there is me. Uh, so me, I will do that for the first year and a half of the tank and mm. then I get lulled into submission. The fact the tank just looks awesome and it's doing really well, it doesn't feel like it really needs that water change this week. <laughs> My wife is telling me I need to do uh, like uh, mow the lawn, we need to go to the park with the kids, we need a barbecue, and the water change just gets lost and all that and I don't come back to it. So here's the thing, that is me. Uh, I am uh, less frequent and you mm -hmm. watch the thing and the tank will ebb and flow you know, in results along with that. Or you can just do it real stable. And so for me, mixing up a month's worth of salt and just doing the water changes automatically, water goes in, water goes out, no mess, no mm -hmm. fuss. And all I had to do was dump some salt, mix some water and walk away. That is the right maintenance rhythm for me. All right, so if there's only one thing more than anything else you'd like everybody else to hear, what is it? Uh, for me, it's that 10%, that 90%. So a 10% water change only leaves 90% of the problem. So, you know, if, if water changes just aren't solving your problem and you're saying that ah, it's just not my water change, that's not it, maybe you got to consider doing a bigger one. Uh, and just if choose water changes as your problem solver, but make sure that it actually solves the problem by doing the right amount. Yeah, so super close to that for me. Actually, we did a recent video called uh, Mastering Pollutants in Your Tank. Mm -hmm. And you may not think about it, but like fish food and additives and salt mix and fresh water, basically every single thing in the tank has a potential to pollute the tank. And water changes are actually the universal solution to maintaining all of those at reasonably safe levels. So if you want to learn about that, actually go check out our Master Reef Tank Pollution right here.